Uh, everyone, thank you for coming. This is uh, such a great turnout. I'm so happy. Um, so I'm uh, Rory Lindsay. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, and I'm just so happy to welcome you to the third event in our series, uh, which is called Buddhism and Posthumanism. Uh, today, we are joined by uh, Janet Gyatso of Harvard University, whose talk is titled Being with Animals, Buddhist Resources. And uh, just a quick note about a uh, talk that's coming up in only two weeks. Uh, the, the fourth event. So the next event will be on the feb, uh, February 10th. And uh, Kalzong Dorje Butia of UC Riverside is, is joining us. And Kalzong's talk is called The Chili and the Bears Are My Uncles, Buddhist Interspecies Relations in and Beyond West Sikkim. Um, I'm going to quickly hand this over to our new director, the new director of the host center, uh, Sung Jung Kim. I think I was muted, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Well, thank you so much, Rory, and greetings, everyone. I'm really de delighted to be here at the first event of the year sponsored by the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Toronto. And to be able to especially introduce myself for the first time and meet you all as the new director of the Ho Center. Uh, my name is Song Jung Kim, and I'm currently associate professor at the Department of Art History uh, at U of T where I teach and research ancient Greek art and archeology span as well as Kandaran and South Asian Buddhist art. Um, and I can't express really how excited I am to become a member of this really like thriving community and to be able to join a global institution that supports and promotes a wide variety of research and activities that represent the diversity of Buddhist traditions around the world. So um, the Buddhism and Post-Human uh, post series that launched in the fall of 2022, organized by professors Rory Lindsay and Francis Garrett, um, examines the place of humans in our world and how humans relate to other animals and the consequences of anthropocentric attitudes. It looks to explore how Buddhist traditions understand relationships between humans and non-humans, and how those traditions might confront destructive human behaviors connected with animals and, of course, with climate change. Um, by putting our own perspective in the context of the globalized world and situating ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the diverse web of nature that this world represents, the series really profoundly resonates, in my view, with the Ho Center's mission to rethink Buddhism as a discipline in our religiously plural environment and its connections with social, ethical, and philosophical issues of our contemporary society. So I, I guess now we'll get started with, uh, with the land acknowledgement. Um, the University of Toronto operates on land that for thousands, year, thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And we are really grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And with that, I'll hand it over back to Rory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunjung. It's so great to have you as the new director. Welcome. Thank you so um, much. <laughs> I'm happy to um, be here. <laughs> Um, so I, I just want to say a few things before I introduce our speaker today. Um, so we were holding these meetings on Zoom to facilitate uh, a broader accessibility uh, and participation. Um, and so some, for some of the events, there are reading materials that have been made available. Uh, in the case of Professor Gatso's event, it was a, a video, which is great. Um, and so those are available uh, on our website, the Host Center website. Um, so for uh, today's session, just a couple of details about uh, this particular meeting. So the meeting is being recorded, um, but your names uh, and the chat are not being recorded. Uh, so we're going to edit the recording and post it on our YouTube channel and our website. Um, and the session is also being live streamed on YouTube, which is really interesting. And that's for those who can't join us on uh, Zoom today. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. And so you can raise your hand in Zoom. And uh, I'll do my best to, to get to everyone. Um, and you can unmute yourself once I, um, once I uh, indicate that it's your turn. Um, and of course, for now, just keep yourself muted, just keep the background noise to a minimum. Um, and you're also welcome to post comments in the chat as we go. 
Um, so uh, I'm really happy that uh, Janet has joined us today. So Janet Gyatso is uh, the Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies and Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs at Harvard Divinity School. Um, Janet is uh, one of the most influential scholars uh, ever in Tibetan studies, actually. Uh, and uh, she's authored uh, numerous books and articles. Um, if you haven't read Janet's work, she has an amazing gift with language. And I, I really just encourage you to, to, to read everything that she has uh, put out there. Um, so two of her books um, I'll mention first. The first is Apparitions of the Self, which uh, looks at uh, the autobiographies, two autobiographies by Jigme Lingpa, and uh, it's just a fantastic study of autobiography as a genre. And then and much more recently, um, Being Human in a Buddhist World, uh, this, this came out uh, maybe five years ago. And uh, this focuses on alternative uh, early modernities vis-a-vis -vis religious and scientific epistemologies into that medicine uh, from the 16th through the 18th centuries. Uh, Janet has also co-edited um, a volume uh, called Women in Tibet, Past and Present, and another edited volume um, uh, is In the Mirror of Memory. Um, and more recently, um, Janet has begun working on a project that explores the phenomenology of living well with animals and related ethical issues and practices. And so we'll be hearing about uh, that work today. Um, a couple more things I can say. Uh, so Janet was the president of the International Association of Tibetan Studies from 2000 to 2006. And in 2018, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is a, a incredible honor. And uh, it's, this is a testament to Janet's contributions uh, to Tibetan studies and Buddhist studies and religious studies. Um, on a more personal note, um, Janet was one of my advisors when I was doing my PhD at, at Harvard. Um, and early in my time there, uh, we discovered our mutual uh, love of cats and started sharing, uh, you know, YouTube cat videos with each other by email. Uh, and I had the pleasure to, you know, take many courses with Janet over the years, to end reading courses, uh, seminars, lecture classes. But uh, right at the end of my degree in 2018, uh, I had the good fortune to, to sit in on uh, Janet's first class on the topic that she'll be talking about today the topic of animal intelligence and interspecies ethics. And that class really stuck with me and it really resonated. Um, and actually it was uh, one of the inspirations for you know, creating this series. And so you know, I'm just indebted to Janet in so many ways. And uh, you know, today's meeting is, is just one of those ways. So, so with that, um, I would like to hand things over to Janet. Janet, thank you for being here with us. And we're so excited to, to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rory. And, and thank you to the host center for inviting me and to definitely thank you to Francis as well and everybody else. It's really great. And I love to hear the introduction to this whole series. It's really fantastic. Um, and what Rory was just saying is true. And we have a long uh, relationship and especially it has been, we have discovered our mutual love of animals for a very long time. And I know Francis feels that way as well. And Francis is an old friend of mine in the whole Tibetology scene. Okay, thank you so much. And again, for inviting me. And yes, this is a topic really close to my heart. And um, I've been working on it actually for a few years. Although um, in many ways, for me, it feels like it's, um, you know, something that I've always wanted to do my whole life, except that, I, I mean, I never, wanted to write a book, which is what I'm trying to do and lecture, but it reflects a love and interest and passion of my own that's been my entire life, which is basically a very, very deep love of animals and a desire to, I don't know, to explore. I mean, I, mean, I guess the primary motivation of this project actually is my horror and my deep, deep sadness over the plight of animals on our planet today. So it is you know, human beings very rarely think about this or see images from it, although these images are available. They're unbelievably horrible. There is a 50 billion times worse Holocaust that's happening every day onto all kinds of incredible creatures because of um, our current global economic, you know, um, uh, situation and everything that's going on. And it's unbelievably horrible. I can't even begin to conceptualize the, the depths of the problem. 
And so, and I don't, I mean, I wish and I hope that somehow the work that I'm doing would somehow contribute to that. And I'm not, you know, person, I don't work in politics or economics or all of those, you know, very practical things. And so the purpose of my project actually is to, you know, and it's something that I figured out is what I really am doing is that I'm trying to cultivate a sort of virtue ethics. I, I think this is in the realm of virtue ethics of trying to cultivate in myself and also share with others uh, our capacity to appreciate the value and beauty of animals. And what my hope is, is that if we can get that really deep into our bones and really, really feel it and see it, that uh, somehow it will motivate us changing the situation that we're in. You know, that in itself is of course a very, very big presumption, you know, and many people would question whether personal, you know, ethics or, or you know, feelings on an individual level is gonna have some sort of systemic change and really, you know, sort of approach the, you know, the huge, huge problem that we have. But, you know, maybe this is, this is what I can do. This is my contribution. And I believe it's the sort of humanities dimension of the problem. So it certainly is within um, the realm of the post-human. Um, and so it's very much about the post-human in the sense that, you know, I just feel that we have way too many human beings on our planet right now who are just, you know, really messing things up and shifting the balance to the point that it's unsustainable. And, uh, you know, we really have our many, many other fellow creatures on this planet that we should preserve and protect more in addition to just making our own lives more palatable. So it's a very, very complex question. Um, but um, let me just, my final introductory statement um, is that um, there's so much in this area, both in terms of, of um, what can be articulated and what can be understood and um, what can be seen anew uh, that I feel actually almost you know, overwhelmed by the project. Once I'm starting to think about animal epistemology and animal knowledge and animal forms of communication and the values and the incredible you know, genius of the so many different life forms that we have on our planet, I'm just like overwhelmed with so many different ways this thing could go you know, and I, honestly, I wish, you know, I was young and just starting my career again, I just totally go into this area. Uh, and I could, I could well imagine, you know, you know, and it's so much reading that I have to do and research and everything, but it's just so productive, the more that I think I'm really, really excited about it. So I am actually working on a book. And I mean, I do have the book, uh, a couple of chapters written, and I don't know, I'm going to try to get that finished. And then think, of, I'm also thinking of doing a video project with a a student of mine now, I have a very wonderful and talented student who's an artist also, and also loves an animals very much. And we're thinking of doing like some just videotaping of my pets and maybe her pets. And I'm actually going to show you one of those in a mo moment of that I just made my myself. But anyway, the project can go in a million different ways. It's, it's not 100% Buddhist, you know, so like this one thing, you know, this is like supposed to be about Buddhism and post-humanism, but you know, it's, it's very deeply inspired by Buddhism for me, but it's also Janet Gasso, Janet Frank, who grew up in Philadelphia, was born like, you know, a Jewish kid in 1949 in Philadelphia and grew up loving animals uh, from the bottom of her heart. And then it intersects with Buddhism. And the parts, you know, when I have become uh, connected to Tibetan Buddhism, I mean, the one thing that has struck me very deeply is the um, practice of compassion, you know, obviously this is a huge Buddhist concept, but of the, you know, I was very, very fortunate to study Tibetan Buddhism with a number of older Tibetan lamas who were here in that first generation when they were first starting to come out of India and out of Tibet. And um, the, I was, so I was the student of several different teachers, but one, for example, a wonderful teacher was Deshun Rinpoche in Seattle, Washington. And I used to, I stayed with him for one summer and studied with him and we would take walks around the block every evening. And uh, he had one leg that was, um, he couldn't bend his knee. So, but anyway, how he would speak to the animals on the street. So always he would address every animal that we met, you know, especially people walking dogs or anything else, you know, birds or squirrels saying, oh, mani pam hill, mani pam hill, you know, mantra of compassion. Um, Tibetan lamas definitely believe that if they meet up with an animal, 
that uh, hears them saying Omani Padmehim once, their next lifetime they were born as a human and then they will soon get enlightenment. So they actually, you know, it's a practice of, of like actually being efficacious to the animals around you, but a deep, deep love. And the, you know, the main part of it is just like noticing, you know, instead of talking necessarily to me, he would also be paying attention to the other life forms walking around the block. So that, I mean, it rubbed off on me, you know, I'm already very deeply attuned with animals, but I really, really connected with that. Um, and, and the second story that I just want to share with you, which is a uh, very complicated and we could talk about it, for hours, and I, I had, I talked about it in my class. We got into big debates about it, but anyway, but it's a, a story about having. When I first went to Nepal, and I went to Parping, and I think it's Dakshin Kali, which is the main temple in Parping, uh, which is a temple that is devoted to the goddess Kali and entertains animal sacrifice, I believe, once a week. And there are large numbers of people who go there with. Um, uh, chickens, small lambs or rabbits um, and sacrifice them uh, to the goddess. Not sure what they do with the bodies afterwards. And that would, of course, would be a question when they eat them. I hope that they do. But anyway, I, as a kid, you know, in my 20s, got to uh, India and was first studying Tibetan Buddhism and, and then Nepal. And I had no idea about any of this and went there one day. And I just remember just having like aesthetic shock, just primarily of just seeing, you know, going to this temple, this beautiful temple and seeing this whole line of people who all were holding these cute little animals, you know, and it was so sweet and beautiful. And I said, oh, you know, how nice. And then I realized that they were being held, you know, in line to be, have their heads chopped off, you know, and then made into a religious ritual, like sprayed on the image of the deities, which actually were, as I remember, I've been trying to confirm this, was it's actually a very old temple and has Buddhist stone images, a stone image of Tara and Manjushri, but I'm not sure if that's true. But anyway, I remember just being like totally blown away. And I, luckily I was with uh, several uh, teachers uh, from the Sakya school were accompanying me and this one older monk, you know, I just looked at him like, and he knew what I was going through and he could see, you know, he, he just read my, he just read it and, and he knew what I was going through. And he, I remember, and I was looking at him like, how do I take this in? How do I think about it? What do I do about it? You know, and I remember him just like looking me straight in the eye and like his face expression did not, he did not give me anything. He did not do it. It just was like, this is reality and looking at me and wanting me to see, you know, samsara or something like that. These are two, you know, experiences that for me um, imprinted upon my mind, um, just the depths and the complexities of compassion. And I do uh, continue to be that way uh, myself. Um, I suffer and feel very, very sad at the suffering of animals, even though I'm implicated in it. I don't want to go any further, by the way, not to say that there's all kinds of complicated ethical questions and I'm implicated in, in, in them myself and I'm not a total vegetarian either uh, and so on. But anyway, um, although I would like to be and I'm trying to be, and I'm get, becoming more and more <laughs> and, and truly more and more. But anyway, um, the, to get down to the substance of the talk, the, so the first, this is sort of in line with the, the book that I'm working on. So the first picture part, part of this is a practice. So I've done this in like the classroom is to um, engage in the practice of watching and being um, observant of animals and enjoying them and looking at the way how, and how much we appreciate them and sort of just increasing, you know, our joy and pleasure with them. So this can happen, you know, if you have pets or if you live on a farm or, you know, if there's any animals outside, you can spend your time outside. But one of the ways that I do it in the classroom also is by um, uh, looking at certain videos. And, you know, I am sure that many of you are aware of there that there's enormous number of beautiful and fantastic animal uh, videos on the internet. I mean, I, I embarrassed to say that it's only been about a year or so that I've been aware of Instagram, but Instagram is just an incredible resource for beautiful and fantastic nature. I mean, I'm sure it's a resource for all sorts of other things, many of which I might not like, but at least if you just limit it to 
animal stuff, there's just like amazing and beautiful things. And also many other videos watching animals. So the, the, the project is basically to pay more attention to them, you know, get into the habit of paying more attention and soaking in, experiencing, registering the joy and the pleasure that we feel when we see them. And actually thinking to yourself, why is it that I get so much pleasure from this? So this whole, pre this whole presupposition is based on a presupposition that we love animals very much. And it's my contention. I know that it's not true that all human beings love animals very much, but I actually believe that most human beings do. <laughs> I actually believe that humans beings naturally do and those who don't had a bad experience in their childhood and that's why. But actually I think that almost all babies and children love animals. In so uh, you know, I know that that's a radical claim and you can argue with me, but even just even for those of us who do appreciate animals to build it up even further and to look at it, to appreciate it, to cultivate it, and then to actually use it as an object of meditation and investigation as a way. So there's two purposes to this. Um, one purpose is, I, it's my contention that the more we appreciate and admire them and see their value, you know, and see them as in some ways on a equal footing or close to equal ethical footing or status of value and worth as human beings. So to value them more. But then the other part of it, which, you can, it's also, it's like a side effect, but it's like a very welcome side effect that goes along with it is that we ourselves also learn from animals to use an, a, a, a phrase that I've gotten to learn from uh, my colleague, Charles Halsey, uh, to learn from them. In other words, the more that you appreciate about animals and you see, like with my cats and so on, I start to see the level of communication and intelligence that they have, and I also start to see the texture of it, I start to understand all kinds of other things about communication that are in some ways, you know, better than human things. I mean, I'm learning from them about how to be a better communicator. And I, I feel like it enhances my life as a human being to be, you know, sort of more spontaneous or more um, animal-like. Not completely, I'm not saying that completely, but it's something that enhances my life too. So there's two benefits. One is that hopefully it will actually eventually have a trickle down impact on the actual situation of animals. And I think it also contributes to our own just simply human ethical life. So both the post, the, the outside of the human and the human itself. So I, I wanna just, first of all, show you a couple of videos to show what I'm talking about. And also, Rory, please, you know, it's very hard for me to keep track of time. So um, sure, sure. remind me when I'm about half done. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so this is one video which I've shown a lot. And actually, if you went and saw the other talk that I gave, embarrassingly, I probably showed the same video, but this is one of my favorite videos of all time, which is that uh, this is um, actually, this is a practice around the world. I wasn't really aware of it, but actually any place where there are cattle and actually other types of an animal as well, which have cold winters tend to keep the animals in the barn in a sort of, you know, enclosed space during the cold winter and let them out every spring. But apparently it's a well-known fact that uh, when the animals come out, and this is what you're going to see, uh, they, you can see their palpable joy and pleasure that they're being let out of the barn. And uh, people in the neighborhood know about this. So it's like an event and everybody lines up. So uh, in order to watch this, so you can just see this. So they're just, <laughs> they're looking around. No, he realized. They're all going, oh, we're out. <laughs> I can't not laugh every time I see this. Look at them. They're, they're, they're each, they're, each of them, like they're celebrating. <laughs> so this is a baby cow. This is really funny. Yeah. 
So he had never been out. I don't, he or she had never been out before. Okay, anyway. Uh, so that's one which, um, you know, I don't know, I hope you found, um, gave you, made you feel happy. Uh, and you just see pure happiness, you know, and it's really just wonderful, you know, you just can read it in their bodies, you know, it's, I don't know if, if anyone could actually propose some other um, plausible explanation of what it is that we're seeing, even though, you know, no, we don't know the inside of their minds, but I think there just can be no question that this is absolute, just they realize, they remember from the past, and they, they realize, oh, I'm out of this beautiful place that they recognize, you know, and then they don't do that for the rest of the summer. They're, you know, they're walking around and just enjoying, but, you know, they're just recognizing and remembering. And it's just really, really um, makes me happy, makes me very fantastic. Yeah. And I just saw somebody's chat that would love to have the link. You can easily find it. Just Google cows coming out of the barn. Um, but, you know, it's just like a way for me, I think, you know, why do I, one of the questions to ask is why do I take pleasure in their pleasure? Why does it make me so happy to see them so happy? Um, and that's one thing to uh, ponder and maybe has, have as a object of a kind of meditation, you know, of self-observation, of recognizing, you know, what is it that makes me love animals so much and why is it what is it about them that makes me so happy in their presence? So again, this is me. So I don't know how many of you share this with me and it feels very strange to be talking to a very large audience, uh, many of whom I don't know. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, so that's one um, thing I wanted to show you. And then let me go to another one. Um, hold on again. one of the things you can see very often online is a lot of interspecies communication that happens. People have these strange things. This is just a normal family who has this dog and another dog. And then there is this uh, kind of, it's a crow or an, uh, um, uh, something like a crow, a raven, who uh, this is a wild bird that has befriended these two dogs. So this is just, so this, this raven lives outside, but he comes to the house every day. They let him in. So you can go to this, it's Peggy and Molly, go to their in Instagram page. This raven comes in their house and plays. They're, they're playing, you know, so the raven is not afraid to get bitten by the dog. Look, and, and, the, and, the, and the raven has figured out a way to play with this dog and the dog, you know, figured out a way to play with the raven. And it's not, Hernia, the raven is chasing the dog. I mean, it's just like amazing to me. So this I'm sure happens in the wild all the time. You know, I, I don't know, but, um, or maybe it's just an artifact of, you know, contemporary human, you know, having pets or something like that. But it's just sort of incredible to me. And it, it be like, you know, in, in animal studies. So part of this project is obviously related to animal studies. And one of the big issues within animal studies uh, has to do with, you know, the status of animals, the intelligence of animals, um, and the question, you know, very famously um, posed of, you know, how do, how do I really know anything about what's going on in the mind of another? Uh, how do I know, you know, how can I say that I understand what's happening between these two animals? But what we're looking at in some sense is, you know, because we're such different species, and so I will never know, you know, what it feels like to be a bat, for example, in the famous example. But what we're looking at is actually concrete proof that here you have two animals of very different species. I mean, the bird is not even an, a mammal, you know, let alone a dog. And yet they are clearly, they have communicated, they understand each other sufficiently enough to play with each other. I mean, play is a very sophisticated activity and actually, I'm very interested in the whole notion of play to begin with. And I think that the more that one plays with another in general shows a kind of sophistication of culture that you can do things that you're, you're, you're pretending to be fighting or killing each other, but you're not actually doing it is a very sophisticated, you know, for fun and for 
you know, the scientists say for training, but in fact, I think it's basically for fun and enjoyment on their part. But here you see, it, it puts the lie to the idea that just because you're in a different species that you can't um, understand each other and can't communicate with each other. So anyway, you should go to this, this Instagram page. There's another one, which I wasn't able to find for today, but where you see the, the guy who's like the quote unquote owner of these two dogs. And he goes out onto his backyard with the two dogs and they're standing in the grass. And this bird had been like away for, I guess that's, it's, it's Peggy, that's the bird. Uh, this bird had been away for two days and they hadn't seen it. They were wondering where it was. And then all of a sudden the guy has his camera on, the bird comes flying in the sky towards them. And you can see the birds like high up in the sky. And one of the dogs is jumping up and down, totally recognizes the bird coming in the sky, like from you know, many yards away, you can see that's our friend bird. The bird lands, you know, and it's so it's just like incredible. Okay, so and how smart they are, they remember each other. Okay, so that's enough of that. Uh hold on. And I'll stop. Um, the third thing, let me look here at my notes. So, um, you know, talking about where this comes from, from Buddhism, there's two main parts of this project that I consider to be Buddhist. Number one is the compassion and the love and the connection to, you know, and I certainly believe that the more you love, uh, the more you have compassion for, and the more you are connected to. The second part, so there's part two, which I haven't mentioned yet at all, is I'm also using Buddhist techniques of meditation and both theory of meditation and actual techniques of meditation, which I studied actually, you know, from the theory perspective. And then I also a little bit know something about from the practice perspective too. But so I've kind of, I'm thinking of, this is a little corny, but I'm thinking of almost floating like a project. Uh, to introduce a new type of meditation to the world that instead of like meditating on your breath, what you do is you go around and it's a walking meditation, but you just hang out with an animal like your pet or maybe an animal, you know, it could be a bird in your yard or a squirrel or something like that. You're not allowed to do, you're not allowed, you're not allowed to look at any screen. You're not allowed to write. You're not allowed to read. You're not allowed to talk English. Uh, but you're allowed to walk around with the animal and uh, or near it and try to look at what it's looking at, like try to just stay with it. I mean, you're not going to become it entirely, but try to stay with it. It's actually a very hard practice to do. Um, it's as hard as doing any kind of meditation. You know, even me, I'm the great lover. And my cats at home, I love more than God in the universe. I love my cats. But um, even I cannot keep my attention on my cats too, you know, I start thinking about all my human stuff again, like, you know, oh, what am I, have, I have my work to do and blah, 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 blah. It, but as a practice, like a meditative practice to watch them. And I'm interested in, okay, so I don't know how long I have to talk. I'm just going to go through this really quickly. There, there is a connect, there is a, a Buddhist distinction in theory between the intellectual understanding of something and the emotional embodying of, of understanding something that happens over time. And my, my idea, you know, how do we get ourselves to feel more deeply responsible for animals? How do we get to be more compassionate to the point that it's gonna change our action? It has to be embedded in our bones. And so I'm using the idea of, if I were to meditate on animals every day in this kind of concerted and deliberate way, it would you know, both increase my knowledge and understanding of animals and would also begin to prepare me more and more and more for um, uh, ways that I can actually change my lifestyle to be more accountable and responsible to them. And I, you know, this whole project is very much connected to many other issues in environmentalism, not to mention climate change. So it's one, you know, and that's one way that I wanna contextualize the whole thing in the post-human context is that it's it's also about uh, living on the planet more generally as well. But I believe one bigger one big part of it has to do our, with our relations with animals. But I am, so um, um, using meditation techniques of just, you know, helping yourself to stay with the animal. It's hard to stay with an animal for a long time, but if you do it, wonderful things will happen. And I hear, I have a video for you 
of, so I've started to play around with taking small videos on my phone. And I'm also, I'm hoping to do more of this this summer. In fact, I might actually, I think I already mentioned, have the assistance of a student of mine who's an artist and can do video and to video my cats and maybe her pets. She has a dog and a cat as well. Uh, but I wanna show you one video that I did um, make, which happened when in fact, I was hanging out with my cat. So uh, yeah, so I'm hanging out with my cat and I'm walking across the street with him. That's him. And okay, wait a minute. <laughs> you see something? Watch this. You see his head? Watch this, watch his head. Okay. <laughs> That's the last part, um, but hold on a second. I'm gonna play that again for a moment. What's what I started noticing, and this is, this is my cat, Toby-san. He's a very beautiful boy cat. And what he does is when he wants you to follow him, he gestures with his head. And so um, he, um, he actually, you know, like I, humans do this too. They sort of shake their head like this and say, follow me. And then he kind of locks eyes with me and gets me to follow and wants me to follow him. And actually he does it all the time. So every day when I'm coming downstairs to feed him and he's on like the top of the stairs, he says, okay, now mom's gonna run down and feed me. He'll like do this, come on, let's go. But he started doing this on this car. So I wanna play this again. Uh, hold on, uh, how, do I, how do I do that? Wait a minute. Oh yeah, okay. All right, here he goes. So watch him. So he's getting me to follow him. See that? There we go. He just, he, that's it. Watch two more. Wait. Okay, there. And watch this. He sees me. Come on, mom. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it's, I'm sorry that the video wasn't so great and it's a little bit cut off at the top. That's why I need somebody to help me do that. But he was, he was communicating with me with his eyes. Cats love to take walks with people and they love it when you walk outside and they will follow you. And it's just like a real pleasure. And, um, but I'm also, you know, so to get to the part, you know, above and beyond training myself and loving animals more, I also find this project extremely intellectually interesting because I'm very interested in types of communication. I'm very interested in bodily communication. I'm very interested in that very instantaneous kind of moment uh, that animals are very capable of where they're very much in the present and they you know, very spontaneously and, and quickly also communicate things to you in a very kind of beautiful way. And that's like the part that I, I both find fascinating. And I also, it's that, that part, which kind of is the part that is the learning from part where I am maybe turned on even more deeply to the way both humans and animals communicate with each other by virtue of learning a lot about bodily language and other type of communication that animals have become so good at. And uh, I'm just, I just find it so absolutely fascinating. It's like a pleasure to me. And it's also something that I, I would love to write about. And so that, you know, in like all the different areas that I could imagine writing in is, you know, things about theories of mind, theories, theories of language, types of language, which are also, you know, very, very big issues that are brought up again in, you know, philosophy of animal studies. You know, what kind of language do they have? Do they have a language like humans? you know, how similar are they to humans? You know, is that even the right question? Maybe humans shouldn't be the gold standard for kinds of language or intelligence. You know, there's so many interesting questions in this that I very much would like to pursue. And so, um, hold on, how are we doing for time? Did I, I think I spoke for more than half an hour, right? Yeah, um, let me just double check. But I mean, you could go for 20 more minutes if you'd like, but we can stop sooner, up to you. Okay. Um, let me just show you one more video and I have two more points to make. So hold on. Um, sorry, it's just very confusing. I just wanted to show you one more photo that I happen to love. And this is the same cat. This is just a photo. That's Toby-san. He is, that's my kitchen. He's jumping down from the top of the counter where he jumps up to all the way up at the top of the cabinet. I actually managed to catch him mid 
uh, jump. But you can see, you know, this cat never went to gym. He never had a teacher. He never did any training. He just, look how straight his body, like his two hands, his two arms are so straight in his two legs. I mean, he's just, it's just a beautiful move, you know, better than any Olympic diver. This is just all part of the, you know, the part about appreciating animals. Actually, another person who's writing these days in animal studies and somewhat in some degree similar or overlaps with me is, and of course she's much better than me and much more important, Martha Nussbaum, it talks about the so-called capabilities approach to animal ethics. And part of that is, is appreciating you know, the special capabilities that she makes the point, you know, there's many areas in which animals are clearly superior to human beings, animals of various types. But any, anyway, that aside, I just want to share with you this very uh, beloved uh, photo and cat. Okay, so I stop share. Okay, so two more points. Um, well, one would be um, in terms of the part of this that I find theoretically interesting and also, you know, trying to cultivate for, let's say, human purposes or my own purposes is the kind of ethical lessons that we learn from animals. And I, I want to call them ethical. Uh, they're just ways of being. They're also very aesthetic. Um, number one would be a, our growing capacity to be spontaneous, to stay in the moment, to be in the present, and to allow um, things to unfold in front of us without planning or having you know, uh, 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 plans or schemes beforehand, but actually going with the flow of what happens in front of us, much like the way that animals themselves operate. I mean, it's not that they never have plans or schemes or they're not planning to go or you know, intentionally going somewhere, which they do, but far more open to happenstance of what happens in front of them and by accident as they're walking, striding through nature outside. And I believe that that's, it's, it's a very beautiful uh, habit. It's a very um, in self enriching habit for human beings as well to be living in the present and, and to allow yourself just as, a, again, this is a human virtue to allow yourself not always to have complete control beforehand, but actually try to live your life in a more spontaneous way and being open to, you know, the, the things that happen to you with, without your prior planning and, and uh, letting things unfold in a, in a kind of um, organic way. Uh, being open also to, to serendipity is just another way of putting it. And the second virtue that I'm also interested in, which is very closely related to that as a human being is honesty. And um, it's not the fact that animals are always honest. Actually, animals do know how to trick each other. And just like they know how to play, they're also capable of tricking and they're very clever. And there's all kinds of ways in which animals will pretend to do something and they know that the other person is gonna think that so that they can trick them and then jump on them and so on and so forth. So it's not that animals are 100% honest. But in general, they're, they're far more honest and more direct and straightforward than humans. They are what they are and, and you can see it and you can feel it. They're kind of very loyal to their base emotions. And, and in some way, I believe it's a virtue that, you know, for human beings, it's very, very complicated, but it's a virtue that the more we can cultivate it, the better. Um, a kind of, maybe it's a theory of auth authenticity. So anyway, those, that's just, you know, if, if I were to write more about this from the ethical dom domain, I would be uh, cultivating those kinds of ideas. I think in, um, you know, I would also, by the way, connect that to the Buddhist notion of interdependence, Denching Jala Jungne, Pratitya Samudpada, which is, you know, a, a, actually is a Tibetan ethic of, you know, uh, enjoying and noticing the, you know, the things that come together that you might not have planned but this sort of fortuitous juxtaposition or intersection of things that come together and valorizing them as a way of, of reading life in a certain way. I could make a case to connect that with Buddhism too, but I'm probably getting too complex here. It's just, uh, I, you know, I'll be very glad to answer questions on any of these in the Q and A, but the one more point I just wanna make, and this is probably way too much, but. As you can see, I'm just like loaded with thoughts on this thing and it's hard to get them all in order. There's a lot of problems with this project. 
And one of the problems, you know, I think um, has to do with um, the ethics of meat eating and vegetarianism. And, um, you know, animals are not vegetarians. I mean, some animals are, but some animals are not. And, you know, in the animal, the world of nature, it's a world of predator and prey. And if we are taking animals as a guide, you know, if, if we want to, if, if, if you think, or it may seem that I'm saying, oh, we should be more like animals. If that's the case, then that means that we should eat meat when we want to, or something like that. It's not, you know, the, the decision to not eat others out of compassion and ethical concern for them is probably not, is one of the, those places where you really don't see examples of that in the animal world. So, um, you know, so it, it relates to the question of, you know, are humans somehow exceptional? What is the exceptionalism of human beings? And human exceptionalism is of course what has led us to the Anthropocene and this belief that human beings are superior and, and, and has a led to exactly the predicament that we're in, but is there, you know, we don't want to necessarily erase all of that either and the value of human distinction and human um, capacities and accomplishments. So that introduces a kind of uh, a complicated question that needs to be thought through and it's connected even to the very valuation of life and death and the, and the nature of life and death that I'm still trying to figure out. Um, David Blake Willis, I don't think there are vegetarian animals. There are animals that don't eat other meat, but they don't decide, you know, on the ethical basis, like, oh, it, it would really be, you know, you know, I shouldn't kill that other animal because I don't want its mother to suffer while I'm killing its baby. So therefore I will, even though I feel hungry for it, I'm not going to eat it. I don't think there's any animals that do that. They're just animals that naturally just eat vegetables. That's true. And we, we do have the capacity to do that. That's the thing, you know, and I actually think that we should, but when, when, when we do that, we're not being like animals, we're being like humans, we're using a human logic. So that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, you know, what about hunting, et cetera? So there's a various ethical uh, conundrum, but now I do really think I'm gonna stop and allow people to ask me a million questions. And I'm sorry if that was not very well ordered or- um, That was great. Co coherent. <laughs> um, okay. There are questions in the chat, but I might start first with, there are two hands up. Uh, David, your hand, I think went up first. So David, why don't you start? I think you're muted, David Collins. Here we go, thanks. So I'll, I'll quickly preface, I'm gonna offer a, a story and invite a comment. And I wanna preface out of a kind of self-consciousness. I'm a pretty grounded person. Uh, PhD in clinical psych, a master's degree from Harvard Center for the Study of World Religion, which was singular in those days, but I've had a number of experiences which in William James' phrase, forbid a premature closing of accounts with reality involving animals. One, I'm in, I do a lot of meditation. And again, it's typically a grounding, honesty sort of mindfulness presence, but have had a few times of entering rather rapturous states. And in one day I'm in such a state and a pair of cats I've never seen before push their way into my apartment and start rubbing up against me, <laughs> purring their little heads off. And in the state I was in, that seemed perfectly matter of fact. <laughs> And when I came out of my meditation, they left. Days later, I'm well, reflecting. I, okay, let me let me oh, in, 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 interrupt yeah, you. Yeah, that's the story. Okay, okay. Well, you've got to finish the story just for time's sake. So just quickly. That's it. That's okay. it. Any comment, reflection. Well, you know, like, well, that's a great story. I love it, and uh, that's fantastic. You know, there's the you know the elephant in the room is did you have was that a vision or were there real cats? Um, but either way, um, that's a beautiful story. And, um, um, you know, I can only share with you a story that I had uh, a few years ago, I was in India, this was in quote, unquote, reality. Um, I was in India, and I was fortunate to be in the presence of the Gela Karmapa, who had just started the 
female nuns or ordination ceremony. And there was a huge ceremony and lots of people were sitting outside with him. And there's all kinds of dogs in South Asia, although in Bodh Gaya, which is where this was, there's actually a whole association that takes care of dogs there, which is really fantastic. Um, but anyway, but there are all these dogs on the street, but one dog, I'm sitting in the midst of people, we're all sitting on, on the ground uh, with our cross legs, it's mostly monks and nuns, but this dog spotted me and he knew I was a softy. He comes up to me, this street dog, and like sits in my lap, you know, and I'm like going like, okay, I'm not touching you, you know, like what, what is on my lap? But I didn't want to touch him even to push away. He just sat and slept in, in, in my lap. And after the ritual is over. So David, I would say that's a beautiful omen. That's a beautiful sign. The, the uh, gods and goddesses of the animal uh, world, um, you know, uh, sent you a blessing. And for two cats to rub against you, there's nothing is better than that. So to quoting uh, Talking Heads, David Burns, there's nothing better than that. Okay, Jose, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Janet. It was a great presentation and it's nice to know what you're working on these days. <laughs> um, you know, I'm also working I, on other stuff. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tibetan, aren't we all? Aren't we all? Tibetan studies, Buddhist studies. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go um, on. You know, I'm sure if you had had more time, you probably would have talked about this. But one of the things that I think um, is important to this whole discussion is what we can learn from animals. And okay. as, especially the kind of their protective nature, the fact that they protect not only their young, but they protect even their kind of other fellow animals and human beings, you know? There's, yeah. the, in Santa Barbara, there's this yeah. house that has a giant statue of a bronze dog out in front. And the local lore is that the owners of the house put the statue up after their house started burning in the middle of the night and the dog went and woke everybody up to make yeah. sure that the whole yeah. family got out in time. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I was looking at my Facebook page. I posted a video. I couldn't figure out how to like bring it back up to the top, but um, it's a video of a small turtle and a big turtle. And the big turtle has kind of fallen on its back uh -huh. and a little turtle helped <laughs> the big turtle turn back up. You know? so, so this kind of protective instinct, you know, yeah. The fact Those that they are fantastic. naturally, I mean, without having to think about it, that it's kind of innate or spontaneous. Yes. Of, no, of absolutely. Wanting, wanting to be helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so obviously parents and their children, you know, and there's all kinds of wonderful videos online of mothers taking care of their babies and also, you know, one animal, um, you know, caring for another. I don't know if there, if you all have seen, there's one fantastic one. You can Google this where... A, some woman has like a camera on her house and, um, and her little you know, toddler is outside in the yard on his tricycle driving around. And so you could, I think it's a camera like a, for a you know, burglary protection or something, but, but it's on. And you see the little kid on his tricycle and all of a sudden some crazy dog in the neighborhood comes running over to him and pulls him off the tricycle. It's like biting the hell out of him. And all of a sudden, like two seconds later, a cat comes zooming around the corner and like, bam, and goes at like the dog and like to get all this kid and like chases the dog away and then runs back to the kid. It's like this amazing, you know, like a rescue Superman, like literally flies in kind of thing. I mean, thank you, Jose. That's a great, you know, that's one of the features of animals that, you know, and again, that's part of their spontaneity. You know, there's that moment when, they're going to do what they have to do. And they just like go right into the moment in this beautiful, you know, and very effective bodily movement. So, but that's connection to their bravery and yes, and that's under the realm of compassion, you know, and connection to others and responsibility. The, okay, the, so the, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I know that there are other people waiting, so I'll make this short. There's one other point and yeah. that is that I wonder, and this comes out of reading a work of the fifth Dalai Lama actually, that um, in order to um, to get rid of, in order to meditate on a positive thing, you sometimes have to get rid of some kind of innate negativity that you have inside that acts as a block to achieving that positive thing. Okay. So, I mean, I won't get into the details, but <laughs> really the question is, is there an element, and this might have to do with the kind of, 
with what you're trying to achieve as a practice, whether or not we have to kind of decondition ourselves to the inherited baggage that we have about yeah. animals before we can truly appreciate them for what they are. It's so, Anything. it's such a complicated question, Jose, and you're absolutely right. But the question is, what is our inherited baggage? And our inherited baggage is so complicated in and of itself. And to uh, even tease apart as human beings and our inherited baggage from animals, you know, my main point to say is that that, that discussion alone takes a huge amount of thought even before we, you know, we know what are we deconditioning ourselves from and what, are, what should we be continue to condition ourselves to. Uh, but, um, you know, I guess, but what you're proposing, I mean, it's very interesting. It's different than the method that I'm thinking about, which is not necessarily to focus on the, you know, like the fact that I feel really bad about myself that I eat meat, you know, and I'm complicit in the meat industry and to be honest, it is true. I am really trying not to eat red meat. Any, in, actually, in my life, I don't eat that much meat in, and getting closer and closer to um, not eating meat. But nonetheless, I still feel very, very bad about it. Um, but that's one thing is to focus on my feeling bad about myself. The other is to do the opposite. Just think about how much I love cows and then to make the connection. Actually, one of I, my brilliant student who's going to work with me this summer, she's doing this beautiful artwork project and one of them she does I should just show you with her permission animation which it starts with like this image of your delicious steak on a plate and then all of a sudden it starts morphine and she takes you way back to the slaughterhouse and you see the actual cow who just got killed and then it goes back to your plate and you say you know you know what you're looking at here this is like here's where this thing came from you know in this actual visual thing to just to see the to, to feel it, you know, so, and, and the feeling itself, the hope is, and that's, this is a theoretical part of it. The hope is that, that the depth of the feeling will transform you and make you commit to uh, changing yourself, or it may be make it even happen naturally that you don't even have to try. Okay. But we have to let other people talk, Jose, but I, I love to talk with you, Jose. We're old friends, by the way, Jose is an old friend of mine because we're of the same generation. <laughs> and I can tell many funny stories about Jose. But uh, it's great to see you, but I would love to talk with you privately. Okay, but who is next, uh, Rory? I, I think uh, Dagmar is next. Okay. Hi, oh, and it's so hi. good to see you. Uh, I, I would I'd like to ask um, maybe what your thoughts are on a specific teaching. I mean, the teaching of the um, six kinds of rebirths, right? And I mean, kind of the hierarchy we have. And also you mentioned that when Deshu Rinpoche, you know, this kind of compassion we have and like for a better rebirth and how we can come to kind of an equality as long as this, this teaching is there that kind of the animal birth is inferior. And so I'm really struggling with that as a Buddhist as well, in the sense of how do we, what are the grounds? And this is this deconditioning, uh, Jose was maybe speaking of, like what, what does it consist of? And that's of course always the suffering. There's always the suffering, but lots of the suffering which is described in the text is of course suffering of the, on the hands of humans, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's not like per se a suffering. And the other one is of course always connected to what are animals capable of and that there's kind of an inferiority. And what is our measurement of that, of their intelligence, of their communication, and all these points you made. So I'm really wondering, as long as this kind of teaching, I mean, to say a little provocative, if we still have this kind of hierarchy, can we really in Buddhist studies or when we work in Buddhist um, epistemologies yeah. come to kind of an equality and a real compassion and learning from each other? So, so okay. interested to hear I, your I thoughts. I have an answer. I have my answer. I've, I've thought about that a lot. Um, you know, so I consider myself a Buddhist. I mean, I am also other things as well. Um, but I, I feel I, yeah, I'm, I'm very comfortable to say I'm Buddhist. I disagree a little bit with the characterization of the six, um, realms of samsara. I think it's an error and, you know, I don't think everything in Buddhism is right. And I think that in Buddhism, has to some degree, and it's a complicated story because you have all these Jataka stories of the of animals who are, you know, exemplars of great human value. So it's 
you know, there's many different Buddhist views on animals, but the teaching that, you know, the only realm of samsara that's good is the human realm. Um, it's, a, you know, and it depends what source you read, but I don't agree with it entirely. And, and it fit, so the characterization of animals as being dumb, like they're less intelligent than humans. I'm not 100% that I actually sure that I agree with it. And at the minimum, you know, I don't think they, they thought about it very deeply. And I think that they were, you know, talk about heirs, heirs to traditions, you know, many human, almost all human traditions have to justify the fact why we're killing and mistreating animals is that we're superior to them. And we are able to do it because we are clever and we are intelligent in some ways, but in the end, you know, human intelligence is, is possibly sinking the entire planet and we've probably messed up so big time, you know, and when, and when we go down, we're gonna take all the other life forms on the planet with us, unfortunately, you know, it's not gonna just be us, that like the human race is gonna be wiped out, but all the other anim animals as well. So, it, you know, but, but that very issue. So I think it's a complicated question and I, I, you know, and I think they're trying to get at something. I mean, one, you know, in the Tibetan sources on that, they mainly stress how animals have a very difficult life because they're, they're, they're prey animals. So it's very much on the, and, and then the other part of it is that if you're a predator, you're earning bad karma and you're gonna to go to hell. And so either way, you're in a very bad predicament as an animal, you're either a prey or a predator. Of course, they're not taking into account and when it comes to Tibet, you know, I don't know if Jeff Barstow is here. I think he did sign on, you know, like, you know, vegetarianism in Tibet and so on. But, you know, certainly for Tibetans, you know, we have many critiques like in Bajra Rinpoche, you know, about the meat eating practices of Buddhists, but humans are just as much predators as animals are. Anyway, the short answer to your question is I think for people who are, you know, you don't have to take, you know, there's critical traditions of theology and ethics in every single religious tradition. You don't have to like take everything for face value. You can talk about it and so on, you know, and, and that's one thing I don't, I don't think they got it exactly right, but there's certainly a lot to be learned about animals in Buddhism and Buddhist sources, nonetheless. Okay. Uh, Kayla. So uh, I was just wondering, I'm having trouble kind of thinking about it because it's like, like, how do we begin to like as a species, like humans as a species, how do we show animals like compassion and respect when we can't even apparently seem to show the same compassion and respect to like other human beings? Like they, if they look different from us or speak a different language or literally anything, like humans can't even treat other humans with respect and compassion. So I'm wondering like how we can begin to treat animals or maybe treating animals with the same respect will allow us to treat other humans with the compassion. And then now I'm thinking about like the whole idea of dehumanization and is it better to like humanize animals or is it better to think about humans as animals? Cause that's what we are. Like we're all on the same, we're at a level playing field or all we all, I don't know. What do you, I, I don't know if you think that's a question but like, what do you think about that? <laughs> Well, there was a bunch of questions in there, so I'm going to have to remember them all. But the humanizing thing, I, I don't think that we should humanize animals any more than we already have. And I think that the pet industry is absolutely atrocious, you know, it's just as bad as the, you know, uh, animal agriculture and, and um, uh, industry. Um, and it's absolutely horrible to um, keep especially exotic wild animals like tigers and, and pythons in like a house. It's absolutely horrible. And I hate zoos as well. Um, and so there are animals that are domesticated. So it's a much more complicated question about cows and sheep and domesticated animals who will whose very existence depends upon, you know, animal breeding, humans who bred animals. So these are all like very, very complicated questions. Um, uh, but remind me, what was the first part of your question again? Oh yeah, how can we uh, treat each other if we, if we can't treat? Um, well, that's also extremely complicated. So it's, you know, we are nice to some people. We're not nice to everybody. So we do, you know, there is, some nice stuff and some bad stuff that we do. The more we can increase the good stuff, the better, whether it be towards humans or towards animals. 
I mean, there is a critical critique, you know, there's a, there's a whole other thing. Actually, I don't have time to go into this, so I'll just mention it, is that there's a whole in race theory and animal theory. And there's some people who say, why are you spending all this time on animals when human beings, you know, have really horrible, horrible, horrible problems as well, which is, that wasn't exactly what you were asking, but that's kind of starts to get into that question as well. For me, the main point is we should practice, you know, from the, I'll just give you a Buddhist answer. We just should be as compassionate as we possibly can in everything that we do. And we should be as responsible as we can in everything that we do. But we're living in a world with animals around us. It's one very big part of our world. And I think it's incumbent upon anyone who's, you know, trying to be responsible and good person to recognize and be accountable to the environment that they're in and the food sources that they're eating and the beings that they're living with and who they're displacing, you know, when they're putting, when, when they're domesticating the land and, and how they're, um, you know, so that, that's where I'm saying this whole project like extends into farming practices, living on the land and so on and so, so forth. But, you know, we don't want to, we certainly don't want to make the mistake that most philosophical traditions, not only Buddhism has made, is like to ignore animals as very, very valuable sources of knowledge. So, you know, animals, you know, they're great gifts. You know, really, I want to get on my knees and thank the universe that there are whales in this world and that there are dolphins and that there are elephants and that there are tigers and that there are deers. You know, there's such a huge gift. And, 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 you know, and I think they're deeply, deeply important. And, and we owe deep, uh, we have a deep responsibility and dogs and cats. <laughs> okay, so, but anyway, the many, many different questions, but thank you. Uh, Umahani's next. Yeah, hi. Um, so I don't have a question. I just wanted to share a story really quickly, which I found really nice. Um, in India recently, there was a toddler, no, a newborn actually, that was abandoned in a sewer. And the only way it was found was that a couple of cats, or like many cats, I think, they gathered around that area and started purring and meowing so loud. And the authorities, <laughs> they're like, okay, there's something here. And they just found a newborn and she was saved. And I just found uh -oh. that not only did they realize it's there, but they realized it was in danger and like they helped it. Wow. But they were purring, you, you said? Yeah, they were praying. <laughs> I mean, you you would think that they should meow, you know, like to purr, <laughs> like to just yeah, it's kind of strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, but meow is you know, and there, there. By the way, there's many stories of cats who wake up their own owners also when there's like a fire in the house. They will run and they'll meow and you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But that's a beautiful story. That's a really fantastic story. Mm -hmm. Cats purr for many different reasons, and. Um, but it's one of the best, one of a friend of mine once said that the best sound in the world is a cat purring. I agree for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the entire, uh, in, 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 in the entire world. Okay, is it Nancy Lynn? Yeah. Hi Janet, great to see Hi, Nancy. you for this wonderful talk. And thank you to everyone for this really engaging discussion. I think I actually agree about the purring cat sound <laughs> being the best. But anyway, my um, I was struck by its stories that you told early on in the talk about how Tibetan Buddhists regard and treat animals. And so I also have a story that leads to two questions. So um, I have a friend from Ngawa um, who moved to Chengdu for the first time. Um, so she came down from the Tibetan plateau to live in Chengdu in an apartment. And after a week or so, you know, she said to me, we were living in the same apartment along with some other people. And, and so after maybe a week or so, she said, you know, I'm really having trouble. There are so many insects here. And I, I try to take each one outside, you know, to release it um, safely alive, you know, unhurt, but there are just too many, I can't keep up. And so I, <laughs> well, my first thought was maybe we need better screens on the windows. Yeah. You know, but also mm -hmm. there's this kind of like ecological change, right? She's gone from one ecosystem where there are fewer insects to another, but she's right. also gone from a kind of cultural um, context, you know, where she learned to do that. She was conditioned to do that in her community. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess my first question is just thinking about how I mean, my attitude to insects changed very much after that interaction, you know, and my regard for insect life. But, you know, this could restructure our lives very significantly, you know, if we take moments like these and really um, 
you know, engage with them. And so I, I, I wonder if that could be a practice in it. One, one of, part of, you know, among the meditative practices that you were talking about, caring for animals, including insects, and giving them that same regard that we would to others. And so one question is, is there a role for other humans as well in this, who are like, like my friend, who, who are conditioned to interact with animals in certain ways, or like the llamas that you spent time with. So that, that role in humans in how we, you know, may teach each other or you know, live oh, together, yeah. in my case, practice together as a community to condition our views and habits. So that can that be part of this project? Um, my other question is, do, do humans- Wait, 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 actually... wait, wait, wait. Can, oh. can you just stop for one second? I'm gonna yeah. write that down so, so I don't forget. Yeah, sure. Okay. And what was the other? Okay. My other question is, do humans naturally love all animals or do we love <laughs> some more than others, right? Are insects harder to love? And is that somehow innate, you know, so, as that babies and small children would love some animals more than others is part of that also condition where we sort of learn that through our human social conditioning. And, you know, is that a role where Buddhist practices of compassion, where you're really regarding the insect with the same care that you would another animal, your pet, a human, you know, and, you know, do we need to decondition, I guess, to take Jose's term, you know, decondition some attitudes we may have about certain animals like insects, they're not as, you know, valuable or precious as other animals or as other humans. So that's my other question. Thank you. That's a great, really great question. Um, um, I, and I really appreciate actually all, and they were all interconnected actually. Um, so first of all, just to go backwards, um, I mean, to, I mean to go because I took notes on what you were saying. I definitely agree with you about uh, taking insects out. I think that's a wonderful practice. I do it myself. I have. I th actually, I, I thought that I invented this. I think I was giving another talk. I thought I invented this, and everybody in the audience was going, "No, I do that too. That's it's like a thing." So, but it's very simple. You you have a like a plastic beer cup, you know, one of those things that you buy that are disposable, just a plastic cup that you can see through and then like a postcard. So when you, when there's an animal say on your, I mean, an insect on your window, you just clunk down the, the, the whole um, glass, plastic glass around it. You don't touch the animal and the animal's inside. And then you slip the postcard under the, 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 the cup and then the, the, he's inside this trap and then you go to the door and let it out and goes like that. And um, yeah, by the way, uh, there is, um, Anne Hireman is here, there is in Chinese Vinaya law, there are extremely detailed instructions of how to do this. So this, this act of saving insects is a very long uh, Buddhist practice, longstanding Buddhist practice. And obviously it's true that when she goes to a different climate, I mean, like in Tibet, you get a, an insect here and an insect there. You know, if you're in some climates, there's really a lot of insects and you just can't be taking, you know, you know, trucking all of them out of your house. You'd be, you know, you, you'd be doing it all day and stuff. So it would be very different there. Um, but I do certainly think it's true that um, we learn. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. We learn from certain human beings who have a deeper and closer connection with animals um, are teaching others. And that's a really interesting idea too. And I'm sure, you know, I might not even consciously remember it, but when you sometimes see one person with an animal and how they're treating them, you like take it in and it enhances you. And it's a kind of transmission of knowledge. That's a beautiful idea of a kind of an animal transmission. So I, I, I really appreciate all, all these ideas. I'm actually writing them down. They're all going straight in my book. Um, uh, it is true, um, um, on one, one second, um, it is true that I do, I agree that, um, you know, most humans probably like are drawn to some animals rather than others. And, you know, the first thing I would say to that is we're also drawn to some humans rather than others. Like there's certain creatures that we're more, just simply more attracted to than others for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, but it is true, um, well, you know, and certainly, you know, you, you might think that we're attracted to creatures that are closer to us that we can connect to. But as you know, we also, you know, you look at the videos of Under the Ocean and you see some, you know, incredible creatures like, you know, an octopi, which is nothing like us at all. And we're very attracted to them too. 
But it is true that we do um, um, privilege some uh, species over others, and it is important to even that out and to uh, cultivate compassion for all creatures and all sentient beings. And, and so that's right, that's, that's an interesting practice. I'd like to just give one story relevant to that is that I used to a long time ago lived in New York City in an apartment and most New York City apartments have, um, 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 what's the bug? Let's just escape my mind, um, roaches, cockroaches. Mm -hmm. And cockroaches are not a charismatic, attractive animal. It's one of the animals that we don't love very much. And, you know, and the only way, you know, they, they have the, the guy come and spray your apartment once a month. The main way to keep cockroaches out of your apartment in New York is you have to be meticulously clean in your kitchen. You just have to like take every bit of garbage out of your house every single evening and just stuff like that. But it's all, you're always wrestling with cockroaches who come out of the walls into your house and it's horrible. And one time um, I uh, uh, had over in my house, um, uh, a, a teacher, a Tibetan Lama teacher, um, uh, uh, Kempo Belden Sherup, uh, who was visiting me and he sat in my living room and just as we're talking, you know, he's sitting on like an armchair and like literally beside him on his arm was like a cockroach. And I, I was like, oh no, you know, please, you're in the living room now. But Kemba Belden, I had never talked to him about this or mentioned that, you know, cockroaches, I have a problem. And it, I don't have a particular problem. I'm just like any other New, New York person. But, but he goes into this whole thing. I couldn't believe it. He said, oh, Oh, hello, how are you? Gusu Debo Yimbe, Omane Pameho. And he started, he went on for, for, for like 15, 20 minutes. To, you know, I want to say, Kimbo, you know, you came here, I have things to ask you about my research and stuff like that. We stopped talking to this cockroach. And he just was like, you know, um, and, and so that's one of the things that, you know, if you believe that great lamas can read your mind, he was giving me a teaching <laughs> on that, you know, I have to have compassion for cockroaches. I mean, I just also think he just was doing it because that's the way he is. But he was like, you know, he must have known that everybody hates, if, if there's like one animal that you want to go away, you know, in the apocalypse, it could be the cockroach. But um, yeah, okay. But anyway, Nancy, thank you so much for all of your uh, yes, and we do have to condition. That's what that's where I'm trying to use Buddhist meditation theory, because Buddhist meditation theory is about how to condition and decondition yourself. That's what the whole thing is about. But okay. Great, um, Manu next. Yes, hi, uh, greetings from Peru. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Venerable Karma Lekshe Somo for bringing uh, her dog to this talk. I'm pretty much distracted by it <laughs> and I'm oh. loving it. So. <laughs> I didn't see, I didn't see. Oh, how nice. Yes, very yeah, nice. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so uh, my question uh, for Janet would be, the, would be the following. Uh, Janet, you mentioned the Yatakas as the having, uh, you mentioned the Jatakas? Oh, the Jatakas, yeah. Yes, as having a negative uh, characterization of animals. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. Or uh, I, I, I understood that uh, they are characterized as inferior to humans, so no. I, not necessarily. Okay, so could you could you please elaborate a little bit on on that? In in the Jataka stories, there's a whole story literature in which animal characters appear, and they're generally. I mean, I don't want to make a generalization. There's many, many different contexts, but in many cases, the animals appear as positive. So I was giving that as an example, not as negative, but as positive. It's giving that as an example of like the Buddhist uh, discourse and discussion of animals is very complex and it comes up in many places. But we were actually talking about a different context, not necessarily the Jatakas, but there is this one you know, Buddhist categorization of the five realms of samsara or the six realms of samsara. This has a complex history of its own. The discourse around that, uh, which comes up in many different kinds of contexts, it may be in some jataka. I don't, I don't know, you know, to what degree that's in the jatakas per se, but that discourse does have the uh, presumption that the best birth of the six realms, oops, excuse me one second, my battery's about to run out for some strange reason. Okay, uh, now we're good. Uh, that discourse uh, presumes that the best birth is a human and the an animal is one of the lower births. So, you know, there's the three upper realms. So that you have that 
categorization, the upper realms and the lower realms. So animals, the pretas and hell. Well, hell is definitely bad. <laughs> and pretas is also definitely bad. So an, it's, it's bad to be born an animal in that discourse because you're gonna be spending your whole life either afraid of that some, uh, some other predator is gonna catch you or you're spending your whole life trying to catch another animal and uh, accumulating very sinful activity. So I don't think that's true. I don't think that animals spend their whole lives worrying that they're gonna be caught by another. I think that animals, and I was reading Barbara Smut's work, who's fantastic, who talked about the bonobos in Africa, but you see it in many, animals enjoy themselves. Animals are very happy. Most of the, see, that's where I feel that the Buddhist account is not, that one is not true. They're actually enjoy themselves. Birds enjoy themselves and animals love to play. And so I, I just think it, there's certain things that aren't true. I don't know what to say. I, that's what I feel, but, but it's not in the Jataka or it may be, but it's, that wasn't the main point of the Jataka. Thank okay. you, thank you so much. Very nice to meet you. Jonathan. Jonathan? Yep. Uh, yes, um, Jenna, thank you. Thank you so much. Just a brief story, which uh, contains a question, but prefaced on the notion that uh, Jiwei, she just mentioned that animals as sources of wisdom and even uh, having a bodhisattva quality. And it's prefaced on my on two notions. One, that consciousness is universal and beyond our brain and that we share consciousness with animals and that we can connect through that even though we don't understand it. And yeah. the second, the notion that um, uh, that human life and all life is like a party on death row. Um, and But unfortunately now we've been sitting there on death row and now we can hear the executioners gathering in the courtyard. Now my <laughs> story is that um, I, I was gripped with the grief for the world as, as a grief for a lost a loved one. And I, and I was stuck. And I was, I could feel this grief and totally preoccupying me. And it was for the world and the end of the world. And, and then I was out walking, trying to seek relief. I sat under a tree and then a magpie landed nearby on a branch and, and started to serenade me. And mm -hmm. In Australia, have, have like a repertoire of 800 songs. This mm -hmm. was a complex serenade. It was, a, it was like, a, a, like a, it was mournful. It was yeah. mournful, like a record. And I just burst into tears. Oh. And it continued and continued. And then I, I had relief from the grief. I was part of part of its world. That's beautiful. What a beautiful story. I completely believe that. And it's really, really beautiful. And actually, you remember that video I showed you earlier during the talk? I had forgotten I, the name slipped my mind. That was a magpie. They're extremely intelligent, but they're like crows and ravens. These birds. You know, and they've got a brain like this big, so it's not a question of size. Um, you know, they're, they watch around, they know what's going on. They watch the humans, they watch everything. And, and uh, you know, that's one has been the revelations in the last 20 years of scientists who, you know, there's so much in science right now studying the intelligence of animals, but, but that's such a beautiful story. And and, and that's part of my thing about serendipity too, is that when, you know, and you were in a state of grief, but you're also open and, and you're just sitting there in grief and then something happens, the, the universe speaks to you. And, and, you know, it's certainly possible between humans, it doesn't have to be an animal, but animals do that. And sometimes they do it in a very, very beautiful way and, you know, and, and very touching way. So thank you, that's a really great story. So do we have time for one more, Rory? Or... Yeah, Annie, you have to unmute. Yeah, 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 sorry, I was okay. muted. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, I can also send a message later if it's easier. No, no, um, no, you, you should go ahead, please. Oh, oh, thank you so much, Dr. Gass. So this is maybe more of just a comment um, and a reflection, but I was thinking about um, life literature and how much what animal kind of literature? life literature, um, uh, like Tongdong Gyalpo and oh. um, Shabkar, like Dr. Garrett had a course all about Shabkar's uh, autobiography, for example. Um, and how much in those stories, the animals sort of hearken to awakening. They're, they're naturally enlivened, like mm -hmm. bears carrying Tandong Gilpo's luggage and things like that. So there's this, yeah. um, this mm -hmm. sort of beautiful um, pattern in Tibetan life literature around those topics. But I was wondering, and I don't have an answer, and I don't mean this to be provocative, but I was wondering if some animals are, um, would resist being meditated upon or would not want to be observed in that way. So I'm just kind of curious, mm -hmm. like, 
where there where the animal looks back, um, how that would affect mm -hmm. that really interesting mm -hmm. kind of meditative uh, yeah. goal. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's right. And you, the way you do it has to be very, very deeply, you know, self-effacing and respectful. Uh, and 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 certainly, if you're walking around watching bears, you you're going to enter the bear world, and you got to be, you know, very very cautious and careful. But you know, so my hope would be that yes, in it's not like you're like you know got like a binocular and you're measuring them and writing down notes. You know, you're sitting in a position of humility and trying to be you know inconspicuous. And just trying to befriend or be close, but you're right, and that's a really an interesting and a good point because it 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 could be um, you know misused to be understood like going on a safari, you know, the, so the whole commercialization, you know, at looking at animals, oh, you know, and so there is a certain line and the ethics of doing that. I, so I, I thank you for that. That's another point that goes right in my book that when you do this practice, there are certain constraints about where and when and how you do it under what context, so I, I really, really appreciate that. But yeah, but the hope would be is that if you're doing it right, it's not like you're observing them, it's more like you're being with them, you're being receptive and open. You know, I don't advise doing this with bears ever, you know, I, it's really <laughs> a good, good idea. <laughs> um, but well, I'll say that when I do manage to do it with my cats, they perk up because they know I'm sort of with them on their same wavelength. And then my cats start jo jo joking around and they start playing and teasing and running around and stuff like that. So, but it, you got to, in order for it to work, you need to get your attitude right. So the animals will teach you actually also in, in that process. So anyway, That's I think, good. yeah, I just, let me just say, um, I, I really appreciated all of these interesting questions and, and, and I, I would love to hear from anybody who was here was any further comments and, and uh, because most some so much of what you said was uh, so relevant to the different aspects of this project and I think and I, I would love to have 20 graduate students who are all working on this and open up a new institute of animal studies and mm -hmm. but that's not going to happen but anyway thank you again uh, to Rory and to Francis and to the host center for inviting me thank you Janet um yeah, and there's so much happening in the chat too. I mean, I wish we had more time to, to kind of address some can, of the can like you questions capture raised. That? I think we can. Yes, Betsy is nodding. So <laughs> yeah, okay. so so we, we yeah, should please. capture that and we can send it to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Janet, thank you again for joining us uh, on behalf of the host center. It's been really, really wonderful to all be here together. Um, and I just want to thank also Francis Garrett, who co-organized the series with me. Uh, our new director, uh, Sung Chung Kim. Uh, it's so great to have you at the host center now. Uh, Sarah Richardson, who is the producer of this series and was the interim director uh, last semester. And then um, Betsy Moss is our coordinator. Oh yeah, good, we're sharing a screen. Um, and then we have this um, amazing uh, undergraduate work-study student, Kayla Billens, who asked a question earlier. Uh, so thank you, Kayla, for, for being here today. Um, and then, I just want to say finally, uh, once again, just to note, you know, we do have um, two more talks uh, coming up. Um, we use the same Zoom ID for, for all the events uh, and you'll get an email reminding you. And so the next one is February 10th with Kalzang Dorje Butia. Yeah, bears. really interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the Chili and the Bears are my uncles. It's such a great title. Um, yeah. And then uh, Dekila Chungyopa, who's an incredible uh, activist scholar at the LOCA Initiative, uh, she will be joining us on March 24th. And uh, Janet, I don't think I've talked to you about this yet, but it would be great. We're gonna try to plan something where all the speakers can come together probably in May. So I'm gonna email everyone uh, this week and maybe we can have one final event where we all come together and have a conversation That would be for fantastic. An hour. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Janet. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, we'll see you next time.